Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to you all. So, yeah, a very warm welcome to you all um, to Wentworth Woodhouse this evening on a lovely, beautiful spring evening. I hope you've had a good day in this glorious sunshine. Thank you so much for joining us for the sixth lecture in our annual series this year. And uh, tonight's lecture is part three in our Wentworth Woodhouse mini series and will be led by our brilliant colleague, Dorian Proudfoot, uh, lead architect at Donald Insull and Associates, uh, working on the stables project. Um, just a quick safety uh, for all of you in the room, if the fire alarm should go off, which we are hoping won't happen, if I could just ask you all to very quickly and calmly just get up from your seats and make your way out of the two doors in the corner, follow myself and my colleagues, uh, our volunteers, and we'll get you quickly and safely out of the building onto the lawn out the front. Most importantly, a massive thank you to all of you here in the room and online on Zoom for supporting us here at Wentworth Woodhouse. Your support to events, a cup of tea, anything like that makes the restoration of this amazing house possible and we're so grateful. Uh, we will be doing questions at the end of the lecture, both in the room and on Zoom, but without any further ado, I'll pass over to Dorian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Lydia said, I'm Dorian Proudfoot. I'm a conservation architect at Donald Insull Associates, and uh, I've been working on the stables project. So this evening is yeah the third in the series that I've been given on the um, projects that we've been doing here over the last three, four years. Um, we started with the works to the roof, uh, the Camellia House last month, and now the stables. So I'll be talking about the stables and specifically the project that we've been doing since um, Christmas last year. I hope everyone can see the screen. I've tried to make it a, a bit higher, but you will be sent the slides at the end as well. So to put the uh, stables into context physically, uh, you would have driven past them as you've entered here this evening, but we're obviously down here in the mansion and the stables are up here at the top of the estate. Uh, and as you can see, they're very large, uh, you know, substantial stables that originally were able to hold over 80 horses. Um, so really quite a large complex of buildings. And a bit more close up, you can see again the scale of them. It's a combination of now grade one listed. So the main uh, courtyard is surrounded by grade, grade one listed buildings. And then the ancillary buildings to the west are grade two listed currently. Um, all in pretty poor condition due to um, just general wear and tear over the years and loss of the, the roofs, the condition of the roofs and water getting in. And obviously there is the large uh, complex of college buildings to, to the west. So the plan this evening is to give you an initial sort of photographic tour of the buildings uh, in their current condition and to show you the different areas because there's quite a lot um, to the complex of buildings. Then I will be explaining the brief that we received from the Preservation Trust here for our project to restore them and to develop the stables into their proposed new, new use. I'll explain the um, process that we went through with our colleagues and the, the large team of consultants involved in such a significant project. And then I'll be showing you the proposals that we've got for the future of the stables. So to start with, we've got some photographs of the stables in their current condition. These are taken from in the main courtyard. I assume quite a few of you are familiar with the buildings already, but here's looking back at the, the north range, so the entrance to the stables complex. Um, from the drive with the main entrance through to the drive. And to the west, you've got the uh, west range, which is the single story side of the main courtyard, which would have held a lot of the loose boxes for the horses. And this is the west range straight on. If you went through that archway, you'd go to Muse Court, which is a smaller courtyard with um, ancillary buildings, more domestic size uh, use of buildings. And similarly on the other side, the East Range is again a single story range of stable buildings um, with another archway which this time would lead through to the gardens and eventually down here to the house. And then turning opposite the main entrance you have the South Range with the coach house in the centre with the two storeys. 
and dead on you can see the coach house here with the flanking wings either side on the south and behind the coach house so in this slide you have the coach house on the left and the riding school on the right what was an open courtyard has been infilled by the college use so when the college was here using this as a teacher training college in the 50s 60s they infilled this courtyard to provide uh, changing room accommodation for their use of the riding school um, so flat single storey building with flat roofs and plenty of roof lights and roof lanterns which have all all failed significantly and the riding school which is an absolutely magnificent building um, attached to the back of the stables which would have been for you know training horses and training people to ride horses um, fantastic building eight bays one of the largest riding schools around with these lovely clear story windows to provide light and ventilation and then just to give you context of where the uh, the courtyards are you've got muse muse court and ostler's court so you've got ostler's house uh, the gardener's house uh, muse cottage so this is muse cottage in muse court which is a lovely little courtyard with cobbled floors and the uh, two-story Georgian uh, Muse Cottage, domestic use and still to this day used as a, as a house. And Gardener's Cottage, again in the, in the next slightly larger courtyard, there's a lovely um, Georgian house called Gardener's House. And next to that is Ostler's, which again is a two-story, uh, originally domestic use, but the college did use this for um, teaching accommodation and residential uh, accommodation on the first floor and this is in very poor condition and the college buildings um, to the west which is the first thing that you see as you drive onto the estate um, long derelict uh, and yeah in the looking back at historic photographs it's amazing how badly it's kind of declined since you know not being in use so there's a combination of classroom structures um, I think they had sort of technology and um, science classrooms in this area and the swimming pool building, which is quite an interesting uh, 60s design. Internally, there is um, all in quite bad condition and all quite altered by the college use. So there's not much left of the sort of original stables um, evidence of use. This is one of the carriage rooms in the coach house. Um, showing the sort of condition that has been left in and upstairs in um, in the coach house on the first floor this did have originally um, lots of partitions when the college used it for um, uh, student accommodation uh, it, those have all been removed the the partitions and we're left with the nice open space showing the lovely trusses in the roof um, but again poor condition so there's lots of propping of the uh, trusses to stop them falling down. In the middle of the coach house is the 20th century infill uh, providing the stairs up to the first floor of the coach house which is you know architecturally in its own right quite interesting but as you'll see um, later on as I show you the historic images and the proposals this is a, a modern infill of what would have been an open open archway through. Some of these stables uh, which would have originally have all the loose boxes in have been changed by the college use and there still remains of uh, the fume cupboards uh, this was a chemistry lab I believe we used it to store lots of the slates that came off the main house here when we did the re-roofing project and then in Osler's house more domestic use of building in very bad condition the floors have collapsed they had they kept the original floors the timber structure and then they'd laid a big concrete deck on top without introducing any extra support so <laughs> inevitably as the roof failed and the timber started to get soft with the moisture uh, it did fail in some areas and some of the rooms are still you know very clear evidence of the college use dormitories with the domestic mattresses and upstairs there's some classrooms so this is a large blackboard on the end of a in the classroom ceilings have failed so we've removed them for safety and then in the north range of the stables um, on the western side 
there are still some of the uh, loose boxes. And then on the eastern side was the estate office, which this is the, a photo from within the estate office. So that's in fairly untouched condition compared to the college side, the south side, which is where our project is focused. And then in the modern college infill between the coach house and the stable block, uh, it's because of that flat roof and uh, the lack of maintenance since the college moved out, it's failed quite badly. And you can see the uh, back of the coach house. So as we've removed some areas as, uh, under our investigations for the project, you kind of reveal where the original building is and where the modern infill. And this is a view from the coach house towards the riding school where the infill of the changing rooms are. So this is how you'd get to the riding school uh, through either the ladies or the gentlemen's changing rooms. Some of them have had their cubicles removed and are quite large open spaces. And then there's still some of the showers and shower cubicles remaining in that infill building. And then through to the riding school, which is a uh, yeah, magnificent space on, on the inside with some college interventions. So they put that um, barrier in halfway to be able to create two, two different gymnasium spaces. Um, this building we re-roofed in phase one a few years ago now. So it's got a nice new Westmoreland slate roof on it and the trusses and the timbers are all repaired. So we know it's in good condition and it had a asbestos ceiling, which we removed as part of that project to remove the dangerous materials. Um, but yeah, it's a really, really lovely space and you can see how it's going to be a good asset to the, to the trust here with their future operations. And then internally, looking at the college buildings, they are in very poor condition, some classroom spaces, some quite interesting classroom spaces where they've you know, raised the roof in certain areas to be able to get light in, but all in really, really bad condition and lots of asbestos and the worst sort of asbestos, which is lagging to pipes, which is, and also the trust obviously don't have a use for these college buildings. So as part of this project it is proposed to, to demolish these college buildings. But the quite interesting, again, the, the swimming pool building with the uh, nice diving boards still intact. <laughs> and then back into the, the stables buildings, there's, as I said at the beginning, quite little evidence of the of the original use. So here in the carriage room, you can carriage house, you can see the what would have been the carriage doors have been replaced with windows and a plinth uh, and a kind of trench for heating. And in the same room, there are some evidence of decorative plaster, but all quite beyond the point of repair and yeah, serious issues with leaks from the roof. I think the most common kind of evidence of stables are the ventilation grills, which are kind of dotted throughout, which would have been you know, to provide fresh air for the horses. And then above the, where we've removed the modern ceilings, you can start to see evidence of the um, more utilitarian roofs with the sarking boards painted and there's some duct work to take the ventilated air away from the horses. <coughs> so just briefly to set the stables in the context of the development of the estate in the uh, 17th century. Um, so we start with the, the mansion and then the west front and then the Camellia House started, and then they did the uh, South Terrace, and then the East Front was finished, and then the stables were completed. And then the Camellia House was refronted as my last lecture in the project that we're working on there as well. So the uh, first Marcus of Rockingham, Thomas Watson Wentworth, rebuilt the West Front of the house in 1728, and we think that was to the uh, James Gibbs design. And very quickly after that, um, Marcus decided to start work on the east front. So that was Ralph Tunnicliffe who started the design there. Uh, he then went on to design the um, Camellia House or the Lady Rockingham's Tea Room. And we think this is a recycled front because um, that's a limestone. They were using sandstone on the estate at that time and it's not really you know, Palladian design. And then the South Range, as I said, was built in 1736, including the lovely Ionic Temple, which again, we're hoping to do um, restoration work on this year. Uh, the East Front 
which was completed in 1750, which was started by Ralph Tunnicliffe and then finished by Henry Flickcroft. So that's the building that we're in now. And then the stables in 1766 were begun um, to the design of John Carr. And these really are you know, some of his finest, finest work and some of the most significant stables in the, in the country. So part of our project, we look at in the archives and we look at the historic evidence um, for the development of the buildings and how the different parts of it were built along the ages. Um, so we start with a map from 1778, which shows the stables up here. I've tried to put, use a red star to kind of help you find it. Um, but note that there are some elements missing that we know now, so Gardener's Cottage and the south uh, end of the East Range. And then in 1841, we've got a tithe map, which again shows um, without Gardener's Cottage. Um, but then in 1849, we've got an OS map that shows the development of the buildings as they add extra ranges um, as, the, uh, as the estate grows, essentially. And then in 1930, we've got an OS map, which interestingly shows um, the Bothy, which has now been superseded by the college building, but you know, that helps us to understand what's gonna be there when we potentially demolish the college building underground. And equally, we look at historic imagery. So there's an amazing collection of aerial photography from about, well, this is from 1926, but then there's a lot more from 1940s, um, which helps us to see in three dimensions how the buildings developed. And of course, there's the mining, which everyone is potentially familiar with that happened here. So open cast mining, our stables are up here, but they mined all the way up to the back door of the mansion. Another view showing in context how much of a disruption that must have been to the estate, um, quite spectacular. Um, and then we've got some really, found some really good historic images. Uh, and these help us in our proposals. They help us to understand how the buildings looked, how they were used, and also provide you know, good inspiration for any interventions or changes we want to introduce. So lovely to see the coach house um, with the carriages out the front. And people using it in context. And then this is a photograph of the North Range. So the first photo that I showed you. So this is the main entrance into the stables. And a historic photo of how the loose boxes were. And you can remember that image I showed of all the slates in. So a lot of that was obviously removed when the college came in and used them as classrooms, unfortunately. This photograph was quite an important one for our project because it raised a lot of questions and then eventually it helped us a lot with our design. So we couldn't work out where this was, you know, in the existing buildings, um, but using the sort of historic photographs that are scattered around the estate here in the mansion, um, we were able to kind of work out that that was a garage building behind the coach house attached to the riding school. So we were starting to work out where that photograph was taken and there was a glazed screen up against, a uh, glazed canopy up against the riding school. Um, through our discussions with um, the Trust here and Historic England um, and using these historic images, photographs, maps, we're able to develop our proposals with you know, the backup of historic evidence. There's quite a few examples of where we've taken opportunities um, to kind of drive the design development. So this is the main uh, view of the coach house on the south range of the stables. And then the you know, historic photograph showing without the infill, the view through to the riding school and these lovely timber coach uh, carriage room doors. Bearing in mind that our project is to focus on the riding school, which I'll come on to in the brief, but this was a, a great opportunity, we thought, to kind of reinstate that walkway through and to you know, bring back the scale of the buildings rather than going through an enclosure in the coach house. Muse Cottage currently just has windows, uh, four windows on the ground floor, and you access it through another part of the wing. Historic, not, not too old, this photograph showing originally the door there 
and how the railings you know enabled you to go into the to the muse, muse cottage we thought this would be an a good opportunity which will come clear clear in a minute similarly from the same spot if you turned around and look back at the uh, west range of the stables this is what it currently looks like with the college building attaching to the stables and here's a historic photograph showing how it looked before so that's would be nice to if we're going to be demolishing the college building, which we are, to reinstate this arrangement. And the back of Osler's uh, currently. And again, not, not too old photograph, but showing you know, evidence that it was rendered for most of its life and how the, you can start to understand how that building kind of breathed towards the garden. The gardens are behind us. Some areas, um, the opposite applies, where they've already been unpicked. <coughs> Um, through the development of, since the trust had taken over, removal of dangerous materials. So this has got an asbestos, this had an asbestos roof and the structure was unstable. So now that's been removed and you start to appreciate the buildings and their relationship with each other uh, and the courtyard. So that's all the college infill for the rest of the courtyard up to um, the west range of the stables. And then in the in the riding school, the college used it as the gymnasium, and we've got some good photographs um, which explain how it has evolved since their time. So this, um, this barrier through with uh, folded partitions and a lot of um, steel structure for all the gym equipment up into the roof. And then that kind of explains what, all the ventilation and the steel that's up in that roof space. So our project, um, which we um, were very fortunate to, to work on, started last Christmas, as I said, and the brief was based on the master plan, which the trust developed as they took over here. Um, very simply, it was, this was it, essentially. They'd kind of given a guide of what they wanted the stables to be used for. Um, so we have a large events space in the riding school with supporting kitchen and toilets in that courtyard once the college has been removed. Uh, a cafe or restaurant with a kitchen and some toilets for itself. Um, a sort of educational event space uh, and a dining room. And then offices and accommodation in Oslers. So that was the brief that we started the project with. Uh, as part of the project, as I went through last month with the Camellia House, um, we have our accurate surveys to start with so that we know exactly what we're dealing with when we start our design. So we have a very accurate measured survey of the whole building, all floors, all elevations, all sections. We also produce what's called a Matterport, which is like a Google Street View of the building, which is really useful. So we spend a lot of time on site, but if you're looking, if you're, you know, back at the office doing things, you're able to kind of walk around the building, which is really good. Uh, photogrammetry, so rectified scale photographs of the elevations. And then kind of your more standard line drawing elevations so that we have everything to scale and we can start proposing our changes. And we have a team of specialists that work with us as we're the lead consultant. And then there's a, a big array of other separate companies that work with us on this project. So going to show some sort of key examples of the work that we did as a team um, through many days on site surveying all the buildings together so that we can share our findings and share all the experience that we've got of historic buildings but starting with the archaeologist uh, they've got some really good photographs which might show areas which I haven't covered so far so their report just kind of highlights some of the, the key elements like we've said so the historic original doorways, which you know, a lot of the room has been changed for the college use, but you've still got the original doors, door surrounds, uh, architraves. Um, they noticed the change in um, walls up above the ceiling level, so that can give you quite a good indication of the development of the rooms. And some good images of the riding school from the outside. Um, and this is from the garden side, so something that came out in our kind of discussions that actually the the stables are very much utilitarian so therefore storing the horses and when guests arrived they would bring their horses there and that's you know a lot of servants would be at the stables but the riding school is actually more associated with the house so the riding school is for the you know the 
the landlords, the people who live here to, to enjoy rather than for the use of the stables. So that's quite an important connection to the garden rather than to the, to the uh, rest of the stables complex. Osler's house, um, some good evidence of the reeded floors. So a traditional way of creating a first floor would be to put a bed of reeds and then the lime ash floors. Um, like I said at the beginning, the, the college then put concrete on top of them, which is a shame because it's, um, we can't really save them. They're not very, you know, they're not gonna <coughs> stand up to the future use. Uh, and then underneath Osler's, there's a really nice brick vaulted cellar, which is quite large. And then uh, we worked with Hutton and Rostron, who are timber specialists. They look at all the timber throughout the buildings to look for decay, uh, dampness, uh, issues that we need to address in our proposals. So checking moisture content with their moisture meters. Uh, again, they notice the reeded floors and they comment on the timber construction, um, all the interesting joints from the original building. Uh, typical, well, yeah, pretty, typical example of where a gutter has failed and years and years of water getting in here, taking out um, hips, rafters and dragon ties and all sorts. Um, with You can see the rot there growing on that. Uh, they comment on damp issues and you know, clear evidence of water ingress and how that might be affecting the rest of the building. Uh, vegetation growth and what that can do to the elevation. So we need to consider that when we're proposing the repairs to the stonework. Uh, yeah, clear evidence of water ingress, probably from failed parapet gutters. So it kind of trickles down through the building and you start to see the erosion on the surface. Uh, we use uh, thermo imagery to, because a damp wall will be colder than a dry wall. So you might not be able to see it on the surface, but using a thermal camera, you can see where there's evidence of um, saturated walls and we need to consider that in our proposals as well. We work with conserva uh, conservators to survey the plaster work and to help with the um, significance and condition of the internal finishes. Uh, they provide a really useful report, again highlighting kind of evidence of original um, doorways, uh, looking at significant features inside really good exercise of looking at historic photographs and noticing issues back then and then looking at kind of how that's affecting the plaster work now so you know it's a long-standing issue that's been going on for decades which in turn kind of affects their proposals for plaster conservation this is just one example but for, for all the plaster in in, in the uh, riding school um, they provide a condition survey showing the uh, phasing how old each each area of plaster work is and the condition, whether we can keep it or whether it's in danger of falling off in the next few years. We kind of want to provide the trust with a sound building that's not going to have issues in the near future. Also analyse the materials. So take lots of samples of the plaster to work out exactly what um, sands and what lime was used so that any new materials we propose are compatible with the old. And really interestingly, we do paint analysis. So these show areas where samples have been taken, very small scratchings of the surfaces of the plaster or the walls or the windows. Take them back to the lab, take a really thin slice and then look at it through a really good microscope and you get to see the layers of paint to work out the color schemes and the type of paint used. Most interestingly, I think, on the external windows. Um, so you can see the different colours throughout time. Everyone, you know, most recently white. But yeah, lots of different interesting schemes of the estate colours and off-white. And yeah, really interesting and helps inform our proposals. Mason Clark Associates are the structural engineers that we work with here a lot on all the projects. They're conservation accredited like we are, so they know what to do with an old building. Um, they do their surveys at the same time and provide a report showing areas of structural issues by their usual sticking a screwdriver into a rotten beam. <laughs> Lots of propping in the stables are really, really poor condition. Uh, you can see previous repairs. So that beam has been cladded either side in uh, a long time ago, probably. Ru uh, truss ends 
completely rotten where a uh, valley gutters failed. Um, lintels all over the building have uh, rotted away and in danger of collapse. Max Fordham are the uh, mechanical and electrical consultants. So with the stables, we're starting from scratch with the electrics and plumbing and everything. It's, you know, all needing to be replaced. So they start with a uh, environmental strategy. So we kind of start high level, work out the overall scheme, how we're gonna do this. Sustainability is very high on the agenda. So look at the uh, options here for like natural ventilation, um, look at the different uh, energy consumption for the options. So you've got, you know, conventional gas boiler down to air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps. Um, so we do that exercise to help the trust to work out or for us as a scheme, you know, if we want to go down the ground source heat pump route to provide heating, um, which will be the most sustainable renewable, but that also then in, informs exactly how we're going to um, propose the floor slabs, the insulation on the walls. Are we going to have radiators? Is it underfloor heating? That all kind of needs to be taken into consideration right at the beginning so that we're all on the same page. Uh, at Insoles, we have our own team of researchers, uh, historic building report writers who, again, do the archive research, find old plans, which help inform um, significance and opportunities, more importantly, or as importantly. Um, so you can, we look for, this is the plan from the college proposals. Um, we know that there's going to be quite a lot of intervention in this project. If we're delivering an events venue for 700 people on a grade one listed stables, we're going to have to be building some quite significant kitchens, for example. So we need to work out exactly where the best place to make those interventions are, where the fabric has already been altered by previous owners, the college or before that. So when we go to Historic England and the planners, we can kind of justify that we've focused our proposals on the, the, the best opportunity, the area where it's going to have least harm on the building. Um, some more historic plans which help us to understand the use of each area. And the college, this one specifically is the college building. So that helps us because you, you don't just kind of tell a contractor to demolish a building, you need to explain to them how we want them to do it safely and in which sequence. So we then produce uh, demolition drawings here, showing them which bits of the college infill we want to remove, but we do the same for the college building. We also include some of the, um, not just the modern material, you know, if we're providing a new doorway into the riding school, we kind of want to show that on the same drawing so they're doing all the same actions together. Now I can start to explain our proposals. So having understood the building as, as, as much as we can with all of our different consultants and reports, um, now that we've got a full understanding of the building, we start to propose our interventions. And on this project, because we're moving the car park up to next to the stables, which is the next slide, we know that the visitors are going to be entering this bit. This is going to be the entrance to the estate. So we work out with the trust exactly how we want the visitors to move around the courtyards and the stables. So, sorry, this is the one slide where the plan is on a different orientation, but here's the drive. The drive comes down the bottom. Um, the college building is here, obviously and our project initially was focused on the south side of the stables. So we decided, our, obviously our car park is going here. We want, thought it'd be a nice journey for the visitor to come into Muse Court first, that more domestic, quite nice, intimate sized courtyard um, first, and then come through that west uh, arch into the large main courtyard for that sort of wow factor. Um, ticketing would then be right in front of you. So you come in, you can see exactly where you need to go to um, pay for your ticket. And then from there, you either go into the gardens or you'd be collected and come down to the mansion through the west gate. And then once you finished your day on site, you would come back the same way. You'd either come back from the gardens in through the uh, east gate or uh, through the north gate and then out through Muse Court and into the car park. So there's obviously an opportunity there for the shop or, you know, for a commercial opportunity for the trust. So we decided on that first. And then from there, we um, 
started the car park design simultaneously with the stables design. So with landscape architects, um, starting with quite open and green, uh, but not very many car parking spaces in the initial design. We then flipped it on its head and tried to show what the most intensive car park would look like and eventually got to a very good compromise where we've maximized the number of spaces but we're able to keep all the mature trees and provide good new uh, greenery around. We can keep the hedge that comes all the way down here. Um, so just to give you orientation, you're coming down the drive now. This is where the swimming pool and the college building is, which is replaced with the car park. You would come into the car park. You've then seen where you're heading, kind of get that visual connection to the entrance, park your car, come round, uh, and then we're bringing people towards the stables, the west elevation of the main north range, which has been hidden by all the college buildings for years and is really quite a nice thought out architectural elevation. You see that come to the sort of, there'll be a eye, eye catcher there, a statue or something, and then you turn into the courtyard um, to start your day at the estate. Simultaneously, like I said, we start, as soon as we've got the plans from the surveyors and we've done all of our survey work, we start to think about how the rooms are gonna be used. We've got that brief from the client initially, but quite quickly we kind of worked out that if people are going to be entering here then the cafe was proposed to be there on the master plan we suggested we move the cafe over here so that's kind of a quite a high use by visitors the cafe don't want it back in the corner riding school is always going to be the main events space uh, we initially showed the kitchen in the um, courtyard as a standalone building and then multi-purpose event spaces and dining room we swapped that with the cafe. Uh, toilets here, so there's quite a lot of discussion of, you know, if you've got 700 people here, um, we needed to provide a decent amount of toilets for events. Um, in this first instance, it was a separate building, so you'd have to come outside, so we very quickly introduced a covered walkway in the courtyard. Um, biggest change to them, you can, we do many iterations of plans, here we, uh, following that first design, this is when we start talking about that uh, garage building that we noticed on the old plans and photographs. So we thought with Historic England, that would be the best opportunity to um, recreate that footprint. There's clear evidence of a historic building on that site and um, that wouldn't be as contentious as a new building inside this courtyard. Um, that was the main change. And also the uh, discussion on the walkway, the archway through the coach house so initially we were just using the existing um, you know, doorways, inner doorways and that stair up. But once we decided we would like to reopen that, we then look at options. So how might that work with stairs and toilets? Similarly, same discussion on the first floor. There's not many first floor areas in the stables, um, but there's, we're proposing a bridal suite um, for people having weddings here and then a sort of two bedroom suite on the first floor of the coach house. Uh, similarly, um, overnight accommodation on the first floor of, of Oslers and some staff room, which then we uh, added some plant room because there's going to be quite a lot of uh, equipment. And we start to think how our architectural interventions are going to look. So we start sketch, sketching out how the covered walkway might look like in the, in the courtyard and the uh, coach um, garage extension, which is going to house the big kitchen. 400 people sitting down for a wedding um, banqueting you need to provide 400 meals in one go so it's going to be a very big needs to be a very big kitchen we think about how our interventions are going to look in elevation and this is the back of the coach house south range uh, and how the new building might look and then the individual elements of, of the glazed walkway is going to have need to have timber posts so are they rectangular square oval. Uh, we study the languages of the buildings, the you know evidence on site for arches and um, engaged pilasters. We think about the, the walkway um, that could have double columns, um, kind of reference historic photographs, uh, example projects that we like, the kind of contemporary. The philosophy with you know new interventions to historic buildings is you can try and make it 
look obviously different. You know, we want don't want to kind of match exactly what was there historically. This is an opportunity to introduce new 21st century architecture. So we also look at yeah uh, good examples of aids that we like to help to explain to the client what we're proposing and make sure that they're happy with the idea. Internally, again, we're thinking what our proposal is going to be. So using all the information from the other consultants about the plaster condition um, and the ventilation, we think about internal treatment, um, what plaster needs to be saved, what um, needs to be removed and renewed. We look at issues around water ingress and all the different types of doors and windows and college interventions. Do we want to keep the college doors? You know, is there opportunity to improve the riding school for its new use? Externally, we carry out our conservation uh, condition survey of all of the buildings. So looking in really fine detail to make sure that we're restoring them to the, to the best of our ability, not leaving the trust with a liability. So we carry out condition survey of all the stonework, all the pointing, lead work along the parapets, all the rainwater pipes um, to provide condition drawings, which then we convert into repair drawings. So the contractor knows what they're supposed to be doing to fix the building with lots of different keys showing different stones to use, different mortar, um, where we're indenting, where we're replacing a whole stone. And similarly for the um, main elevation of the coach house, um, which produced quite nice drawings, but showing, and you'll notice here, we start to show our proposals as well. So not just repairing the existing fabric, we're explaining what we want the building to look like. So here's the main entrance to the coach house. We're opening that back up um, using the, our interpretation of the gates that are on the main entrance, because you want to be able to separate, you know, if, if there's an event in the courtyard, and there's a wedding going on in the riding school, you need to kind of keep people separate. And then each area of intervention and design, we have kind of design progress sketches. So initially that we look at options for a solid roof on the covered walkway in the riding school courtyard, uh, introducing these double columns from our precedent studies and a glass roof so that if you're walking under that, you can still enjoy the incredible elevations of the historic building and zoom in even more and how, how is that going to be detailed does that need to fix to the building it's a grade one listed building we don't want to leave any we don't want to damage it if we don't need to and then in the riding school as i said it's uh it's the main event for the for the proposals uh, we're talking about potentially having 700 or more in in this building it's a massive part of the trust master plan, you know, to create money, to be able to keep the maintenance going on this, on the mansion, on all of the buildings on the estate. So our strategy for the rest of the building is to have natural ventilation so that we're not, you know, introducing unnecessary um, plant that's going to cost money to run, use up fuel and create carbon. However, in the riding school, in, we did the calculations with the m and &E consultants um, you do um, 3D modelling with the weather, looking to climate change. We found out that with 700 people in there on 10 days of the year, it would be too hot. It would be over 24 degrees for more than three hours, which you know creates an uncomfortable space, which would mean during the highest part of the season, where lots of people are having weddings in the summer, they wouldn't be able to use a riding school. So we do have to introduce mechanical ventilation and cooling. Um, into the riding school, which comes with it quite a lot of plant and equipment. So how are we going to install that without ruining the look of the, you know, the grade one listed riding school? We looked at an option of putting all that kit at the back of, of the main space and then introducing a, a new back wall to look like the old one, which is too much of an intervention, we think. It, it you know, reduces it from symmetrical eight bays down to seven. Historic England weren't happy with that. So another option is to introduce a mezzanine floor. You can put all the storage, because there's going to be lots of chairs and tables, etc., which need to be moved out quite quickly. So with the mezzanine, you can have storage. Um, there's space for all the plant equipment, so the ducting for the, you know, blowing the nice cool air in, and stairs, 
um, to get up because we need to go through at first floor into the new extension and it gives an opportunity for a bar on the top. We looked at a solid, um, a solid wall up to balustrade level or an option with a, you know, a glass balustrade to kind of reduce that impact on the building even more. And the new extension that's going to house the very large kitchen. We again did lots of elevation studies. How do we introduce a new building in a grade one listed courtyard that is a lovely piece of architecture, but doesn't detract from the already existing lovely piece of architecture. So we look at lots of uh, different um, glazing options. So we've already provided those sketch plans early on, like we showed you, which were agreed. And then we look at how that might end up as a full design. So we start with um, kind of the rectangular windows. We look at different stone. Should it be a paler stone that really stands out compared to the historic building? Or could it be a reclaimed stone so that it sort of sits quite evenly? Uh, might it be better with arched windows because that's quite a common language around the stables. There's lots of archways, whether they're you know blind or actual archways that you walk through. Um, and then is the glass, you know, what kind of specification is the glass? Is it reflective, non-reflective, dark, light? What are the glazing bars? Are they gray or... So we look at lots of options and discuss them with the, with the team. Uh, and then show built examples of what we're thinking so that people can visualize what, what this building is going to look like in the end. Um, and kind of go into a bit more detail showing how the glazed walkway sits. Um, nicely with our design so it all looks like it works together. Uh, the doors on the coach house are quite an important part of the project. This is the current situation. We, from our historic photographs and you know research, we obviously all established that it would be lovely to reinstate the original carriage doors. So our initial proposal was to uh, reinstate the carriage doors on the outside which would bifold away, and then you'd have a glass screen on the inside because there's no windows at the back of these rooms. So you need to get light in. You don't want them to be dark and dingy. So most of the time during the day, the bifolding uh, timber doors are gonna be open. So you need a glass screen to keep drafts out in the winter, etc. However, we wanted to explore options that you don't have that glass screen because that is quite a big intervention again in, in the room, you know, the, those rooms which were restoring the plaster work and putting new floors in back with the original kind of stone floor. It might not, we want to see what it would be like without that modern glass screen. So we looked at actually introducing glazing into the carriage room doors and how far you go with that, what it, what it does to the elevation. Uh, but eventually we kind of came back round to having the, having the glass screens at the back and then to explain to the client and to the uh, planners so that they can give us permission for this. We kind of show what it will be like with the doors open and folded back and then a glass screen so you can see the activity behind. And then working out how that's going to actually work in practice. Is it going to have runners? Is it going to be kind of flapping around? Does it need bolts? Where do the hinges go? Are the hinges symmetrical? We look at other doors on the estate and for, for kind of inspiration. We do the same sort of thing with the landscape. So this is Muse Court currently with the hard standing. We've got old evidence of it being a bit more of a softer treatment. And anecdotally, you know, even back in when it was in use as stables, um, this would have been a softer kind of courtyard. So the landscape architects again do kind of initial sketch designs um, for all four courtyards. So main courtyard has got a lovely cobbled border, which we want to keep and restore and repair. And then a gravel, compacted gravel main courtyard. Um, you've got the lovely cobbled courtyard in this court. This, this is going to be, be an extension, extension of the events venue. So if you're having a big event here, you're going to spill out into that courtyard. So that needs to be quite level, hard standing. Um, and, but it also wants to kind of talk to the architecture. So you reinstate a main you know, visually a path to connect you know, right through that archway to the main door of the riding school. And then the uh, yeah, Muse, Muse Court or Osler's Court, we call it as well, uh, with a softer scheme of planting. 
this was the first scheme and then we work out how again humans are going to use it so deliveries to this large kitchen and people arriving to stay overnight for an event you kind of want to create different routes for them so deliveries would come across and then down the back of the kind of utilitarian kitchen and then visitors would come straight down the axis to the front door of of Oslers. We've also taken the opportunity to reconnect the riding school to the gardens. So, so looking on historic maps, um, you can see the old pathways. We want to recreate them with a ramp so that if you're having an event, you can make use of the lovely gardens. And then this sort of dead area at the moment, we want to bring that back into use. So thinking about improving that and putting seating area. And obviously our new events courtyard, we want that to be able to um, work with the gardens as well. So that solid wall at the moment which keeps you kind of enclosed in the courtyard we've been putting new openings in there so you can spill out into the gardens and our final plan so we now include muse court got added into the project as we were going along so these are our proposals which have been um, sent off for permissions hopefully you got the main riding school with storage underneath the mezzanine, a lift up onto the top of the mezzanine, um, the whole try to make everything as accessible as possible. We've got um, ostlers as overnight accommodation, so ensuite bedrooms. Has to be quite a large plant room for the equipment to keep this, this building, um, the riding school at the right temperature and ventilation. Very large kitchen. So working with the catering consultants, we work out exactly how the kitchen is going to work. You, you know, it's very, very technical how you have, you know, goods in, food deliveries, cold rooms, preparation, washing up, pot washing, uh, a very long pass so you can do those 400 meals in one go. Um, coming round to the, obviously open that up so you, people coming for an event which go straight through to the riding school. A dining room. So if you're having a smaller, more intimate event, you can have a dining room which is directly served by a kitchen. A concierge and entrance, so if you're coming to an event or you're coming to kind of book an event, there'll be a sort of reception area which has um, lift and stairs up to the first floor of uh, the, um, the uh, up to the first floor of the, uh, what's it called? Um, and events, uh, multi, three multi-purpose event spaces with their own toilets and servery. So you could be having a big event in here and um, multiple events also. So the trust have got maximum kind of income generation. Tickets, as we discussed up here. And then Muse Court, as I said, you'd be arriving and exiting through here. So a shop, which you would come into in the sort of domestic size, nice rooms of the Muse Cottage, and then through to a larger kind of shop area and out to the car park. Toilets to serve the big cafe and entrance to the cafe here so that as you arrive you can kind of get a coffee. So that is the ground floor proposals and then on floor you've got um, overnight accommodation bridal suite as I said and a two bedroom apartment here. Very large plant room to serve all the kitchens. Staff area so an office and staff room, staff changing and toilets and um, plant room again at first floor and then um, three ensuite bedrooms here. So there's you know, a lot of different opportunities um, <coughs> making the most of all, all the buildings. Our package of work, so we produce very you know, large production of drawings to explain everything to the builders, um, roof plans, maintenance plans, so how are the trust going to maintain all the gutters and the roofs in the future. We need to leave them with a safe building and a, a <coughs> means of keeping on top of it so that it doesn't happen again. Uh, we work with fire consultants to work out exactly where fire breaks need to be, fire, um, fire exits and um, fire doors to make sure everything's safe and compliant. And with the mechanical and electrical, the services engineers, um, like I said at the beginning, we've got ground source heat pumps going underneath the car park. So boreholes, about 40 of them, I think, to provide the uh, heating, renewable heating for the whole stables eventually as it all comes online. And the strategy for um, servicing, 
you don't want to be too <coughs> rough with the building, you know, historic building, you don't want ducks and things everywhere. So the idea is to have a central plant room, which then serves smaller little plant rooms in each of the areas. So that it's very small intervention. It can all be hidden behind um, <coughs> plaster work and in the new floors that we're putting in. And then as the architects, we have to produce, you know, really technical drawings. So this one is of the kitchen um, showing exactly how it's going to be built, all the different areas. You've got cold stores, freezers, um, preparation, larders, pantries, as I said, the kind of the prep rooms. Uh, and you can see the line of the new build. We show in section how the building works so that people can understand how, how to build it and how it's going to be used. So this is through the riding school, through that mezzanine, showing kind of the plant in the roof space, um, the office for the staff, kitchen underneath the staff room, and then from the same area, but from a different 90 degree angle, you've got the toilets that serve the uh, event space, the back of the um, carriage house, and the kitchen, the ground floor, and staff room up there. And then into even more detail, showing exactly how it's going to be built. We're obviously introducing insulation um, absolutely everywhere we can to reduce the heating load and to provide a more sustainable future for the buildings. So as we've done here, we're proposing breathable insulation in the historic roofs, um, renewing the lead and the slates, obviously, and creating ventilation so that you don't get that buildup of moisture, which has that damaging effect on the roof timbers. Uh, lime creek floors which have underfloor heating in them and the uh, detail of the new new section and then even more detail of our lead um, all the different junctions how we insulate everything and avoid cold bridging and that's the full package for the builders we've done that throughout the whole of the south range for all of the areas that we propose new uses for and then Individual elements get their own special drawing. So here's our glazed walkway showing the timber ribs with the glass roof slightly angled so that the water drains off. Uh, timber, which then comes down to a really nice lightweight steel fin that sits in the ground and a very tiny piece of steel that sits against the wall of the, uh, of the um, original building that can be reversible. That again is another philosophy when you're doing a sort of new intervention like this is to try and make it as reversible in a hundred years time. The use might change. They can take this away and there isn't any marks left on the listed building. So that is the, the full scheme. At the moment we've got um, funding to deliver the cafe, which is going to go in the uh, west range of the, of the stables. And I was going to just leave it on the on the plan if anyone's got any questions about the proposals or anything that you want me to kind of discuss in a bit more detail. about you that was fascinating and so much to think about Sym symmetry of door hinges just blew my mind it's like <laughs> oh my god so much detail um so this mic yeah is just really for the benefit of the uh people on zoom but if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask how long is it going to take how long is it going to take dorian so please? as i said we've only got um funding for a small part of it at the moment um but that would take well, the idea is to be building that this year and it will probably take about a year to deliver the cafe in the kitchen. But the rest of it is yeah, still requiring you know, funding and so it could take a long time. Be more specific, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, ca I can't be more specific than that. I believe we have a question on Zoom, Steve. Yeah, the question is, what colour of stone did you settle on? What colour of stone? Yeah. Oh, what for the, uh, the new build? Yeah. Um, that is going to be a, a similar stone, so it's not going to be too contrasting to the, to the original. It'll be new, and the way it's detailed is so that it's clearly a new building. You know, it'd be sharp lines compared to what you have here on the, on the mansion. But 
yeah, it's not too, it's, it's, it's a subtle and the, you can tell that it's a new building by the, you know, the detailing and the crisp lines rather than being too obvious with a white stone. Could I, could I ask about the roof? Yes. Has that got to be stripped and rebuilt? Yes, so the roofs are in poor condition. I think the previous private owners here of the estate, they replaced the, let me get this right, they replaced the slate, but they didn't replace the lead. So the slate of the roofs is doing its job, but it's, the lead is completely perished and you've got really large parapet gutters. That's why all the water is None of it's going down the downpipes, all just going inside the building. Um, so although, yeah, what we do, you know, when you get money like this, um, grant funded money um, and a big project like this, you don't want to be coming back to it in another 30, 40, 50 years. So the idea is to do a completely yeah, renewed roof. We keep all the trusses and all the original timbers, but the slate and the lead gets completely replaced. And then you can introduce the insulation if you're taking the slate off. Is part of it uh, start, uh, not stone? They're not slate. They're not all slates. N no, they're they're all slates. Yeah, the only stone slates you've got are over the long gallery here. Everything else on the estate is Westmoreland slate. Uh, just that having been up in part of it, mm. um, when you look out, they seem to be quite thick. Yeah, they're very thick and very small, but they are well, they range. Obviously, they're diminishing courses, but. They are the, the kind of, yeah, Westmoreland slate rather than a, a stone slate from local here in, in Yorkshire. What about the fountain? The fountain. Sorry, so that was a, a question from one of our volunteers about the fountain, just for people at home. So the fountain doesn't form part of this project. Um, it's obviously suffered very recently because it was in, it was complete when we started the project, but I think the frost has finally got to it and it has yeah, shattered into many pieces, but it's listed grade two. So we, we should restore it if possible, try and piece it all back together. Um, I'm sure in the long-term plan, when the whole stables get completed, it will be reinstated, but currently it doesn't form part of this, this project. Excuse me. That would be nice, wouldn't it? To yeah, see the fountain yeah, back yeah, and yeah, working. Yeah. <coughs> it's just yeah. that when we've, when we've been to a previous lecture, it's mm talked about um, you got the 17th of March when you would be getting the money mm. hopefully is that money what you've talked about for this new campaign? no that that was the that some extra? that's money? the Camellia house project that's the Camellia house one. yeah so Just for the house one. so actually that's a good question because these are both part of the same project which this design work was funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, but the only project that was planning to be delivered by the National Lottery Heritage Fund was the Camellia house so that was the funding which um, they made the, well, they had the meeting last week. Yeah. Um, but this didn't form part of um, the delivery phase. So this is why you have the trust are getting separate funding to deliver this in um, bite-sized chunks, essentially. Okay. Thank you. Another one from Joan. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, I'm just a bit concerned about the banqueting wedding venue yeah. area. Um, having seen lots of events in the house, yeah. and we're always continually having to move furniture, tables, sometimes you want round tables, sometimes oblong tables. Yeah. Is there going to be anywhere in that venue where we can store furniture? Yeah, so that's why we introduced that mezzanine right. balcony, so that yeah. ex for exactly that reason, yeah. So part of our design team includes Julie, the facilities manager here, and you know um, Darren, the cater uh, the hospitality manager. So our designs have are influenced by all the different parties who are going to be using the building. And yes, yeah, storage of tables and chairs was very high up on the agenda because you don't want to be moving them around too much. No, so the plan is that's why I introduced that mezzanine so that you can store as much as possible under there. Oh, it's, so that will go under there with the plant as well. Yeah, so the plant is actually in in Osler's house because it's vast to provide the, the uh, ventilation and cooling for the size of room of the riding school. It's sort of two stories. It goes in the end of Osler's and then it's just a duct that comes through that mezzanine. Right, okay. Are you going to introduce a, a lift to the mezzanine? Yes, there's a lift in the mezzanine. Yep, there's I, pre a I presume the way you're talking, it'll yeah. 
pretty pretty big lift to cope with the, the amount of work. Yeah, so, so we've put lifts everywhere. So every first floor area has is accessible from a lift. And there's a changing places toilet um, up here as well. And we've got disabled toilets immediately accessible from the ride and school event space. Uh, we've got a lift here to get up to the top of the um, carriage room. And um, yeah, so everywhere, every first floor is served by a lift and we've got disabled toilets in kind of strategic locations and the changing places toilet. So the trust are very keen to make this the most accessible heritage venue. And we're trying to stick to that. Now, now you've introduced the subject, is there gonna to be toilets in, in the car parking area? Yeah, I didn't mention that actually. Yeah, so we've got some toilets on the back of Mew's cottage, which will be immediately um, serving the car park. So people arriving to walk the dog and not come into the courtyard, there are toilets there for them. And then there's larger toilets here to serve the cafe. So yeah, we're well, well covered. Are there any more questions this side, just while I'm this side with the microphone? For people at home? No? We'll move over to this side. Any questions from this side of the room? Yeah. Where are you hoping all the funding is going to come from? <laughs> Well, that is an excellent question. <laughs> um, takes a drink. <laughs> so there's a team here that, that um, apply for funding, yeah. many different sources. Um, they're all working away, you know, on divvying it up into small packages and then going to appropriate funders. So, yeah, there's um, numerous different people that are being approached from private donors through to, you know, organisations like Historic Houses Association. Um, it's such a big project, you're not going to get all the money from one source. So, you know, Sarah McLeod, the CEO here, is, that's, you know, a strength of hers is, you know, looking for funding and working out how the best way to fund these sorts of projects are. Yeah, and as Dorian said, it's really lots of different revenue streams and, you know, the trading business, any profit that's made through the tea room, through events, all goes back to the trust and, you know, that's so why events like these are so important to us as well. Uh, we have another online question, Steve. Well, there were two questions, actually. Uh, the first one was, do we know roughly how many people will be able to sleep overnight? And the second was, how many cars will the car park hold? Okay, cars is easier. That's about 200 spaces. That's our, our target. So yeah, 200 spaces in the car park. And um, there's, there's future car parks that are gonna come online. So, you know, there is a master plan for parking and um, transport, which includes other car parks on the site as, as activities grow and there's more and more events and people. But the car park at the moment is designed for 200 spaces and accommodation wise, you've got about, I think it's about 10 ensuite rooms. So that's a combination of Ostler's house down at the bottom here and the carriage house at the top, coach house, sorry. Can't wait to stay in one of those one day. Um, any questions from this side of the room? No? Any questions from the volunteers? Oh, we have a lady at the stand. You mentioned that one and of the houses is inhabited. Oh. Oh. Just so the people at home. You mentioned that one of the houses is inhabited along the... Uh, yeah, it was until about a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> Muse, Muse Cottage was tenanted, but with all the planned proposals, they've moved up. <laughs> I don't know if they were asked to leave. But, um, yeah, so there was a family. Actually, uh, Gardener's Cottage. Um, yeah, all these were inhabited by tenants. But as yeah, the projects come online, they are moving out. I'd just like to add, they are very happy in their new house. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're okay. Any, any more for any more? Any more online, Steve? No. no. Okay, well, once again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. And 
as you can see it's a massive massive job that we've got here so like i said at the beginning any support you can give and do give us means so much and hopefully we'll yeah achieve this one day and if we can give dorian another round of applause that'd be great <laughs> Thank you.